Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Anthony Painter. I'm Chief Research and Impact Officer here at the RSA. And I'm delighted to welcome you all to today's online uh, event. We've gathered uh, an expert panel today to help us discuss an area of growing public concern. The rising tide of harms polluting the digital public square from racism to misogyny to misinformation and how best to stem it. We meet as pre-legislative scrutiny of the UK's draft online safety bill draws to a close. Um, this bill has the potential to be a landmark piece of legislation with far reaching consequences for online services and platforms globally. Is it a next step to a safer web for all? Or should we be concerned about the scale of the new powers it promises to government and regulators? Or does it not go far enough? With us to discuss online safety platforms and the digital public square, we have William Perrin. Will is a trustee of the Carnegie UK Trust and is part of a team that has been highly influential in scrutinising the online safety bill. And we have Chloe Colliver. Chloe is Head of Digital Policy and Strategy at the ISD, the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, and is highly respected for her research shining a light on the darker side of the web, in particular extremism and disinformation. We have Helen Burrows. Um, Helen leads the content and services policy team at BT. And she covers issues including digital inclusion and consumer fairness, content delivery and media policy, online safety and data. And we have Rima Patel. Uh, Rima is Associate Director at the Ada Lovelace um, Institute and a leading expert in public attitudes, public deliberation and inclusive citizen engagement on AI, data and digital ecosystems. She's formerly of the RSA Parish as well. Welcome back, uh, Rima. Always very welcome. So thank you all, to all of you for sharing your time today, and it's it's, it's great to have you with us. Um, I'm going to start off with 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 Will. Will, do you think you can give us just a bit of a primer on the online safety bill? What what's it trying to achieve? How far do you think it's going to achieve in this? What's missing? And you now, what does the concerned citizen need to know? First of all, can I say, as a long-standing fellow of the RSA, what, what an absolute pleasure it is to be here to talk today. But ask me to give a primer on the online safety bill. It's like it's been going off so long. It's like asking someone to give a primer on Doctor Who. Frankly, you know, how's it going in the last decade? Um, but Carnegie kicked off work uh, on uh, devising a regulatory regime for social media uh, back in 2017, 2018, when working with Professor Lorna Woods, um, I was pleased to sketch out an approach at Carnegie UK Trust that said, well, one of the ways we can regulate these colossal companies that span such a huge breadth of human activity um, is the way in which we regulate other things that span huge breadths of human activity, which is, is bringing essentially a, a statutory duty of care that companies should take reasonable steps to prevent reasonably foreseeable harms arising from their operation of the platform to people who use the platform and indeed society at large, because these have been enormously successful companies for their shareholders. And that's what uh, anyone who runs a company is obliged to do. They're obliged to protect the and enhance the shareholder interest. But we got to the point where the operation of the companies was so uh, impactful across society that there were societal interests that, of course, corporations won't take into account because it costs them lots of money, it's very inconvenient, it diverts them from a profit motive, and it's perfectly legitimate for regulators in a democratic society to step in and say, no, you as a corporation should focus on the public interest as well as your private shareholder interest. And the online safety bill, which was introduced, uh, we, we were was published in draft earlier this year, um, is the government's first shot at taking forward set the, the set of proposals that we first outlined back in 2018 at Carnegie. The bill has in it uh, essentially uh, two primary duties of care, uh, a duty of care focused at harm arising from criminal content and a duty of care focused at harms to children. And both of those duties of care are reasonably well drawn. They're not perfect, but it is a draft bill. Um, so it's a very good, uh, very good time to, to polish them up a little bit. And it has a very weak duty uh, affecting harm to adults. And I'll, I'll come to that in, in just a, a second. But around those duties, the government has built to its credit a reasonably effective regime for Ofcom, the current broadcasting regulator, to provide regulatory oversight to how those companies deliver those the, their two, two and a half, I sometimes say, duties of care. And so they have quite an effective Ofcom regime sketched out. And the government's put in some very important caveats to a duty that reflect uh, the significance that some of these platforms have taken in, in public debate. 
they've put in uh, not quite exemptions, but they put they they make platforms consider very carefully speech which is of democratic importance, freedom of speech in general, and to some extent, to a lesser extent, privacy uh, as well. That might already be covered by data protection, of course. So. All of those things are reasonably good framework, actually. They're not wildly dissimilar from the regime being drawn up in Europe under the Digital Services Act, but it's slight like heresy to say that, of course, but these two regimes do have important similarities um, in that they both require companies to do risk assessments of the harm likely to arise from the operation of their service. And this is how we regulate, and the RSA would have looked as over the hundreds of years of the RSA's existence, many, many, many times. The way in which you prevent harm arising from industrial activity is in the modern world uh, to look to make sure those com the company that makes that harm is performing a good risk assessment and then is taking steps to mitigate or prevent the risk it can see arising. And where, in your view, does it fall short, Will? So it falls short um, in a number of areas. And of course, the government, having put forward a draft bill, won't expect civil society to come back and say, oh, it's all great. Um, it's all fantastic. That's not the way it works. Uh, so a draft, a draft bill process with scrutiny by a joint committee in Parliament enables us to point out some of the shortcomings. Um, we think basically it's far too narrowly focused. Um, it doesn't really address broader harms to adults, issues such as the racism experienced by Britain's football, yeah, the U England's footballers, I think you made a terrible faux pas there, by England's footballers uh, a few months ago is not properly addressed by the bill. That's in part because it's a framework bill. So it creates a framework within which the regulator must operate. But the government hasn't gone far enough to fill in the details of that framework. So there are many, many areas where we don't know how it will work. One area though, where we can see how it will work, this is a great concern, is that the government has for no apparent reason, given itself a very broad set of highly intrusive powers to fiddle with the way Ofcom does its regulation. And this is against international conventions for the regulation of media, where the convention is that you have a highly independent regulator uh, whose job it is to make decisions outside of a political context. Okay, well, I'm going, to, I'm going to pause pause you there. I think that, that that's a key a key issue that we'll we'll, we'll come back to in this relationship between government and the regulator. Of that I want to bring in Chloe um, to to the conversation. Chloe, you, you spend a lot of time trying to um, uh, understand disinformation, um, uh, how it spreads, the impacts it can have, how heightened um, it can be in terms of a range of impacts on society from 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 extremism to misinformation or disinformation about health. Could you say a bit about what this this idea of disinformation is about? And then maybe say a little about how you see the um, the online safety bill responding um, to the, the, the threat and risk of dis disinformation or not. Thanks very much, Anthony, and, and thanks for bringing together such a timely conversation. Well, clearly, COVID has sadly taught us more than anything about the real world harms that can take place off the back of online mis and disinformation. Very early on, we saw research that showed that exposure to misinformation about COVID-19 was having a very real effect on people's willingness to abide by public health guidelines, for example. And vaccine hesitancy will continue to wreak havoc with efforts to try and move us all out of this crisis in the long run if the disinformation ecosystem around vaccination is not dealt with appropriately. So, you know, we've learned a lot from what we've seen develop in the disinformation world throughout the pandemic. And we've also learned a lot about what's missing in terms of responses to that. So our latest research on COVID-19 disinformation has, has shone light on a few bits of that. So one would be the policies themselves that platforms have to clearly deal with or set boundaries on this kind of content. And quite shockingly, throughout the pandemic, it's been extremely slow and reactive for tech companies to even put in place the wording and the policies that tell their users what is and is not allowed around disinformation, especially around COVID and public health. We might even look at something like YouTube's recent announcement to ban all vaccine disinformation on its platform, not just COVID-19 vaccine disinformation, and think back to say, well, what, what difference might that have made to previous health crises or previous health risks when vaccination disinformation was having a severe impact on children's or adults' health? So there's a, there's a backlog and a delay in the policies. The second is enforcement. And our research has shown recently that there's a huge enforcement gap in terms of the application of those policies on disinformation and misinformation. Something like fact-checking, which can help to spread accurate information about these things, 
It's just not being applied on platforms like Facebook or YouTube. Uh, it's sporadic. It's incomprehensive. And then finally, we just we don't understand how the systems themselves, the recommendation functions, for example, on these platforms are proactively making these problems worse. Um, our research has shown an 100 fold increase in followers for major anti vaccination influences over the last year on Facebook. We don't know without regulation or transparency how much of a role the platform itself has played in that rise and how much the public's interest or kind of proactive searching for this content plays. So that's an interesting black box for us at the moment. But the other thing I just want to, to note here is that our focus on COVID shouldn't uh, mean that we're not thinking about other kinds of disinformation or misinformation that are, that are detrimental to either individuals or, importantly, society and democracy as a whole. And we also do a lot of work studying election mis and disinformation. And you don't have to look much further than January the 6th in the US this year to see that disinformation about elections, voting, election outcomes can have an extremely real effect on public safety, on people's trust in the democratic process, in their ability to take part in the democratic process as a, as a voter and a citizen. Uh, we know that foreign states have got involved in that many times over the past decade. Uh, we already see this year a number of pro-Chinese Communist Party covert networks online or uh, continuing use of, of Russian media online to try and sow doubt in election processes and outcomes. And for the bill, that's really relevant because as Will has already mentioned, there is a real gap here in harms that affect adults that are legal, like disinformation. There's also a gap though in harms that affect society and the democratic process as a whole, rather than that affect individual health or well-being or the psychological or physical effects that that might have. So there, there's a, a worrying gap here in a few specific areas of national security, of public health, of public safety that are really left out of the scope at the moment, even though on the face of it, the bill is quite broad and has quite a systemic approach to dealing with these kind of problems. Um, I, I think it's the RSA, we, we, we share those, those concerns and in fact, a report that we're publishing today, Platforms in the Public Square by Ash Singh and Jake Jushanda, um, raises exactly those, those concerns. Very, very briefly, Chloe, just before I bring in, bring in Helen, can you, can you just, um, for, for, for those watching, can you just sort of say something about this sort of very briefly about disinformation versus misinformation, how, how they may differ? Or overlap. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's a really critical difference, actually. So disinformation is generally the term used to imply intent behind falsehoods. So purposefully misleading someone through information and misinformation doesn't have that intent. Um, so it's when you might share, spread or create uh, false information, but not knowingly to deceive someone or the audience that you're reaching. So during COVID, what we've seen, sadly, is a crisis in both. Uh, we've seen people who are purposefully exploiting the situation to try and spread falsehoods for their own agendas. But we've also seen a huge increase in accidental spread of false information, for example, between family and friends over WhatsApp or rumours about the side effects of vaccines that get spread through different social networks. Brilliant. Chloe, that's excellent. Thank you very much. Very, very, very clear. Hello, I'd like to bring um, bring you in. Um, and you know, BT is, of course, part of the ecosystem of information. It's not, you know, what we don't provide the services that are that, that are central to the focus of this particular bill, uh, which are more about sort of user to user services and and, and search services. Um, uh, however, obviously, as part of the ecosystem, you will have a perspective. And what would be interesting to know is how have how has BT sort of thinking around misinformation, disinformation, the public square evolved over the last two or three years? And and, and how does that sort of play into the, the, your, your sort of reaction and response to the online safety bill? Yeah, so something that I think for us as a business has been very much influenced by the pandemic, actually. So when this project kicked off, I think it's fair to say that it felt like this aspect of the bill was one where we were more of, a, more of, an, an, of an observer. There's some parts of the bill, sort of serious harms, criminal harms, where we are a direct actor. We are involved in blocking of serious criminal content when there's a legal mandate, that sort of stuff. And this end that was more around sort of societal harms, what it is and isn't OK to say, it felt like that was something that was an interesting discussion, but didn't seem that directly relevant to us as a business. But then the pandemic came along and the rise of that conspiracy theory of somehow believing that the spread of coronavirus was linked to 5G 
became a sort of real time experience for us as a business where we were suddenly the target of a conspiracy theory. And that had very real world impacts. So across the industry, there were over 100 attacks on masts, mostly arson. Some of them resulted in serious damage that impacted coverage, generally not of 5G, because at that point, 5G rollout was relatively early. It's not necessarily clear to a layperson what a mast is doing and whether it's 5G or not. But some of those attacks were successful to the extent that they disrupted service, brought the mast down, brought the mast down for a while. Some of them were near things like critical infrastructure, sort of ambulance stations, that kind of thing. It did have impacts for our customers. There were thousands of customers who for a period had no mobile service because a, a, an attack had damaged a mast near them. And that was across the industry. It wasn't just our business. It also had an impact on our teams that were working, trying to keep the network up, trying to repair things. They, they experienced quite a lot of physical intimidation, some direct attacks from people believing somehow that they as an engineer were somehow part of this conspiracy. So that experience, I think, was very real and drove thinking from sort of top to bottom of the business at the time. And I think really what we experienced there, that was happening. And we were talking to government about it, of course, and government was engaged and they cared. They were telling everybody to stay at home, to do stuff online if they possibly could. We were also talking direct to the platforms that were the biggest source of it, Facebook, YouTube. And yet, even with all of that attention and our resource, it was really hard to bring about meaningful change and to reduce the amount of this content that was circulating online. And I think that really drove an understanding internally for us of how the current system, such as we have one, and it is a system, I think there's a sort of sense of, oh, the current state of the internet is free, but it's not really free. It's a system with drivers that, as Will outlined, tend to be commercial drivers. And at the minute, that current system is inadequate. If a company with our resources, with government support and direct relationships to the largest platforms are struggling to get meaningful change, then what chance is there for some other conspiracy theory that isn't that immediate and well-resourced in terms of needing to do something about it? And so I think that's really shifted from perhaps an earlier position of, well, this is quite interesting, and perhaps a kind of tendency to the sort of earlier discussion around all of this that lots of tech companies still put forward, which is this is about freedom and freedom must come first, but that isn't really good enough and that that isn't really sufficient The current situation is not free. It's shaped by commercial drivers. And we need to think about how we can change those drivers to enable people to still have fun, to still have their freedom and to communicate as they need to, but to really mitigate and reduce the the more harmful consequences of some of that. And so I think we're in a different place now. And and I think that maybe applies to some of the other harms that are coming, you know, that that the online safety bill speaks to. And for me, really, what's interesting about the report is how it really picks that out, that there's a sense of needing to change the drivers on companies. And it puts forward the idea that perhaps there should be a fine for companies that aren't getting grip on this, but also needing to get to address the drivers for individuals. And it has a really compelling stat in there that really stood out for me when I was I was thinking about this yesterday, that of sort of well-known people who put forward concerns conspiracy theories or perhaps reposted content around coronavirus and 5G, that was about 20% of the total postings on that, but it drove nearly 70% of the engagement. And that's just a kind of fact in and of itself, but it partly comes about because I think both individuals that are trying to make a living online, or it's part of their livelihood, as well as the platforms, have an economic interest in promoting this kind of content. Conspiracy theories are intriguing and they make people read. It drives engagement. So both for an individual personality and for the platform, the current situation is surfacing this kind of harmful content over the other stuff. And the idea that in a free world, the wisdom of crowds would solve this, I think, has proved to not be the case. It turns out the crowds are pretty vulnerable to being manipulated and being misled. And we need to find some way that we can address that and mitigate that rather than just let it run. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, um, Helen. I'm going to bring in Reema on, on, on this point, because, of course, the, the, the bill um, uh, shifts this space. You know, the system exists, as Helen emphasised, but it, it, you know, it, it shifts 
content into a more regulated space i think it's probably probably fair to say and and instantly as 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 you've all done in different ways that starts we start to focus on the government and the regulator it's easy for the citizen to get lost in this in this conversation um uh, rima what is the role of citizen when we think about how we might regulate the space um going forward is there a greater role how could it be embedded it's, it's a really interesting question, and the first thing I wanted to know is the extent to which there has been a really live civil society conversation with a very broad range of views on the terms and the parameters of this bill. So it has been contentious, quite controversial. A lot of people have had a range of different views and perspectives about it. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, because it indicates that people these, these issues touch at the heart of conversation people are really passionate about. Um, and, and actually this question, which is um, what the, the next way public square should look like, the digital public square, or actually an extension of something that's quite historic, the RSA being part of, or, you know, those conversation in coffee houses um, that then have become um, part of, 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 of the next way. And um, Anthony, you'll know that my work has focused a lot on um, the quality of dialogue and discussion that, that people are able to have, as well as the quantity of it. And if you think about the, the digital space, um, you know, you've got a lot of citizen dialogue and discussion, but you, what you don't see much of is, um, you know, informed, thoughtful interaction of different perspectives. Um, you, you see that sort of siloing. And I actually think there's an opportunity here in this model to, to, to model uh, both offline and online, what that could look like through informed citizen deliberation. It's not out of the realm of the possibility that there's a citizens' assembly on navigating some of the tensions and trade off that come from the issues that are um, implemented in the Act. And we've seen that work really well in relation to this question, which is climate change, how do we deal with that? Um, so, you know, there is this interesting BBC documentary on climate change, and uh, you can almost see. Um, the people versus online harms um, as, as the next version of that documentary. So, so that possibility is is very much um, feasible and something that that policymakers can think about. And um, one of the things I'm quite interested in here is actually the design end. Um, so, when we're thinking about something like Tabor, you you saw uh, an algorithm that was introduced. Um, that were aiming to do something quite um, experimental. And then people began to be Tabot on, on social media, um, deliberately inflammatory messages. And then Tabot learned those messages and um, that had the impact of um, a lot of racist and, and sexist uh, statements being emerging from, from Tabot. And, and so there's a really important point, which is thinking about this at the end of um, design. So how do you ensure that you're thinking about the impact assessment of such an algorithm and foreseeing that that is a possibility that might happen. And, and, and here it's really important to think about things such as impact assessment that enable us to uh, develop algorithmic systems that don't lead to unintended harm. So going beyond the legislation, thinking about how do you build in auditing evaluation of, of such um, uh, uh, impact, you know, as, assessment seems really useful and important in, in this context and in this case. Um, the other thing that is really interesting is the wider context that we're operating in. So um, last week we did see a GDPR reform consultation deadline um, and in, in the context of that of course there's a wider conversation about individual data rights and um, a conversation about global coordination and um, the UK's ability to be part of the global discussion and debate. Um, it's worth noting that platforms are global, they operate on a global, global scale, and there's something really important about making sure um, that we are able to retain uh, a seat at the relevant table so we can influence um, technology practice. So that's an important consideration as well. Back to the point around citizen deliberation, why does this matter? Um, uh, at the end of the day, this is not just about um, preventing harm, um, it's about uh, creating a positive vision for the type of society that we want to live in. And as the pandemic demonstrated, that society has increasingly moved from purely face-to-face -to, -face to hybrid. Um, so, so this is, in my view, a, a conversation about the next way um, deliberative system that we want to build and an extension of that. Um, so just focusing on harm, is challenging, just focusing on legislation 
is challenging. My, my question is how can we have that broader conversation about what um, our digital public square looks like? Brilliant. Thank you, Rima. You've opened that a fascinating area of conversation. And we'll come on to that, I think, in the next in the next phase of the conversation. And um, where we seem to be coming to often in this in this conversation is this sort of balance between a, a, a duty of care of different players, the platforms themselves, as well as government and, and regulators versus freedom of um, expression. There's lots of different models for grappling with the tensions inherent to that question, um, actually. And I wonder whether the online safety bill is kind of landing in the right sort of territory and maybe by, you know, through improvement, by including a greater um, a, a greater role for citizen deliberation, if you get closer to the right, right point. But where do you think it needs to shift in terms of that balance overall? Should I go more towards where the, the, the French government has, has gone, which is more a sort of duty of care perspective, or do you think that, that the dangers are too great? And, you know, for example, the open rights movement will um, would say actually because the dangers are too great of, of making interventions on misinformation and disinformation, that actually um, you should have a far more of uh, an open um, Internet that, that, that safeguards freedom of expression over care. So where, is, where are we at? Are we in broadly the right place? Will? Uh, there is sometimes a... Um a false uh, binary debate that says this is about freedom of speech or censorship, or that says that, uh, you know, we shouldn't uh, regulate the internet, this kind of thing is not very British, that forgets some, you know, uncomfortable truths that um, we do not have an absolute right to freedom of speech in the UK, we have a balanced rights regime. And often people overlook um, uh, the right to personal, uh, physical and psychological integrity. Um, of people who are victims of online hatred and online harms R rather too conveniently at, at times, I think, because the regime requires some balancing. And people often overlook as well um, that for over 100 years, there have been different forms of extremely well-run media regulation in the UK. Uh, the BBFC since 1913, regulating film distribution, self-regulating it, broadcasting regulation, very deeply intrusive regulation uh, of those media uh, of television and radio, and also self-regulation of advertising that have all worked reasonably well. We have reasonably good structures that allow those to happen. And I occasionally just take an issue with the fact that these are giant free public squares. The platforms that cause the most harm are just giant advertising platforms that manipulate people's views in order to sell more advertising. Um, I think it's slightly slightly out of touch a little bit, say this is, oh, this is a public square, this is a great public forum. Um, it has some of those attributes, or it had them 10 or 15 years ago, but now they're increasingly being driven for commercial gain. And so it's quite straightforward to bring in forms of regulation to my mind, given the context in which we, and indeed the European Convention of Human Rights, provides explicitly for the regulation of broadcasting and the regulation for cinema. It says it in the convention. So I think this is a very modern approach to that, but, one needs to have fall back on strong institutions of the sort that we've had in the UK and in many Western European countries to regulate media, a strong independent regulator that is at full arm's length from government. And this is why I raised in my first uh, intervention, my concerns about the powers the government has given itself without, without explanation to interfere with the day-to-day -day running of Ofcom, including to interfere with Ofcom to ensure that its decisions are coherent with government policy which is very much a step too far. Uh, so um, this is something I know the scrutiny committee is, is fully aware of, many members in the house are aware of, and, and we'll see how many amendments get put down as we've suggested a raft of amendments from Carnegie to limit the Secretary of State's powers to make sure that we continue with a strong, effective, independent regulator in this area that will see us well as it has done in other difficult media sectors. Rima. Will makes, I think, a, an interesting point around public square, and obviously the platforms of the type we're talking about are not the public square in and of themselves. They are part of the public square and components of it. Does it surprise you how much in these discussions there is there is an absence of a wider conversation around the type of public square we want in our modern democracy, or to be a modern democracy, you might even state? Um, so I wouldn't say there's lack of that wider conversation, but it's interesting to me how disconnected these conversations are. It feels to me almost reflective of the 
issue that we've got. There's a very interesting conversation at the moment happening about the GDPR reforms, um, but they seem not to be very linked up to the conversation about online harm. There's also another conversation that seems to be going on about platforms and business models and the way they work and operate. Some really interesting ideas coming out of that, including what public interest BBC style models might look like for uh, platforms going forward. Um, so no shortage of interesting ideas there. Um, what strikes me is that it's fairly um, lacking in being quite coordinated. That's just an observation from following these conversations. They often tend to be um, dominated by very different voices and different perspectives. And there's a really important coordination role there. There's also a separate conversation happening in industry circles around standards and impact and assessment. Um, and then uh, also a separate conversation um, in circles that I'm increasingly part of around citizen deliberation on the impact of technology. Um, and what it just strikes me is that we've, we've just be begun to have these conversations and we're not quite at the stage where, um, where things, are, things are cohesive. So that's my initial response. Right. And um, I think the notion of the digital public square, or actually the public square of which the digital is an extension, is a really nice way to think about, focus on the goals and the objectives. What are we trying to do here? How do we kind of create that next way, coffee house era of the enlightenment, maybe? Uh, and and, and what, what are the different component pieces that... that get off there. Um, so, so that's maybe one for another discussion. Thank you, Rima. Um, Chloe, it's interesting this conversation about harms, isn't it, really? And and the, the bill itself kind of hones in, as, as, as we discussed, on individual harms, sort of um, physical and potentially psych, psych, psychological. Um, uh, it has rather less to say around what we've described as sort of precautionary principle, which is actually how different systems and approaches and regulations have a probability to cause harm, um, either on an individual or a collective um, uh, basis. I mean, do you think we should be trying, I mean, platforms, government, regulators, citizens, we should be far more concerned to be upstream in ensuring that where there is probability of harm, that's pro properly factored in, in, for example, in how particular technologies are designed? I absolutely think that we should try to nudge the approach as far towards safety by design and, and risk mitigation as possible, um, even if just to create a more sustainable tech industry that is serving customers in the way that we might want it to for the long run. I think the difficulty with the online safety bill approach is that I think it tries to take a systemic approach and a sort of risk assessment based approach here. But actually, when you're in the weeds of it, you get very quickly into content. Um, and it's a very hard thing to do, to, to try and think about design, platform design, precautionary risk assessment, without at some point having to still think about what content is good and what is bad. And I think we, we try to get ourselves out of that difficult conversation sometimes by saying, let's take a systemic approach rather than a content-based approach, but realizing that the two do at some point have to meet. So I think that's where the most work needs to be done here, not just in the UK's approach, but also looking at Europe and the Digital Services Act, looking now France, Germany, the US that's starting to have these conversations in Canada, is that tension. Because we do want to build uh, regulatory systems and platforms own policies, terms of service and decision making that is thinking ahead on these things, that is future proofing as much as possible from harm. Um, but actually, I think we're stuck a little bit in how to do that without always having to refer back to what content fits within what bucket. Brilliant. Thank, thank you, Chloe. Helen, let's, let's go on to the platforms themselves. I, mean, I remember us being at a, a, a sort of a, a round table a couple of years ago. One of the spokespeople for one of the platforms basically said, fine, you know, you want us to be better regulated and behave better. Well, legislate for it. And I kind of thought it was astonishing because it was it, it kind of didn't show... Uh, a, a, an attitude of being particularly on it and, and ahead of the game when it came to public safety and reduction um, of, of, of harm. Um, wh where are the platforms in all of this? Do, do you get the sense that they're, that they're I mean, of course, they, they, they said nice things about the bill and the need to regulate and so on. Do you get the sense that they're reluctant travellers in this whole conversation or are they rather more engaged in those 
that kind of sort of systemic link to content analysis that Chloe was was talking about. And obviously in the background of all this, we've got Frances Hogan and her whistleblowing on Facebook and so on. So where where are we at? Are they being honest brokers in this whole conversation from 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 your perspective? Um I mean, it varies, I think, you know, they they certainly have their commonalities between them, but they're not all in exactly the same place. But overall, I would say no. I mean, I think our, our experience of them and there's been sort of other topics where there's been discussion about regulation, say notably copyright, where we were on one side and they were on the other. And I think our, my personal experience of that is they are very sophisticated and formidable campaigners. And they are far too smart to come out and say, we hate this regime and we don't like it and it should stop now. Even if internally for some organisations, that is really what they think. Um, I think, honestly, actually, that take of, well, regulation is needed is, is true and is somewhat in sort of earlier iterations of the Internet, where it was more perhaps about smaller sites, some of which had various types of harmful content. BT and other ISPs were sucked into a discussion about shouldn't you be blocking certain types of content and our view which took a while to evolve but is is a pretty consistent one now is we are happy to block occasionally when required but we want there to be an independent legal basis for that and particularly we don't want as a company to be put in the position of having to decide for actual access on an internet connection that's a pretty blunt instrument Now, when we're talking about platforms, it's something that's become much more sophisticated. But I don't actually think, even if it were available, that an approach of that was entirely self-regulation would be a good one. I think that puts already very powerful companies into an even more powerful decision of deciding what is and isn't acceptable. There's going to be a bit of that, but I think there needs to be a view from government from a democratically elected government on the framework of how they want it to work, and then a view from a sophisticated and well-resourced and independent regulator on the details and practicalities of that. And that without that, it won't really be legitimate. But I think there is a sense that we get pretty strongly, and in, in some trade bodies, we're members of them, and so are the tech companies. And there, I think we see more clearly, as some joint responses have gone in, quite how much they're seeking to say, well, this is all very nice and admirable, but ultimately it's unworkable. And I think I also see the beginning of, I I rather imagine that some companies are going to bring forward legal challenges. And the aim of that really, if you're a commercial company, as they all are, making super normal profits, as many of them are, is to protect that. So you play along, but how do you minimise the regime in terms of actually how much money do you have to spend? Actually, how much compelling content do you have to take down or prevent being posted in the first place? Because that is the kind of thing that currently is driving significant profit margins. And there's going to be a dance there where I think government and and honestly, I think civil society shouldn't fall for the opening line of, well, you know, but we're just on the side of freedom. They're on the side of their shareholders. And then they're thinking carefully about what is the best way to present that. Well, who would be Ofcom in this? You've got, you know, tech companies, um, lawyers breathing down your neck one side and you've described the, the government breathing down their neck the other concerned citizens and the media um from from a different angle um how well are ofcom equipped to take on this extraordinarily complex political legal technological challenge oh they're relishing it i mean you know this is this is what a good regulator is there for And I'm delighted to see that the government has freed up money to allow them to recruit people. So they're recruiting some pretty good people from both from technology companies and from civil society uh, to start preparing to take on these responsibilities. And I was involved as a civil servant uh, 20 odd years ago when I had a full head of hair and only weighed 12 stone or something. I had a lot more energy in creating Ofcom. I did the early work that made Ofcom come into being. Um, and they spent their first four or five years heavily involved in litigation with big telcos. I can't remember, Helen, if, if BT ever fought their appeals all the way through to the end. And they'll be expecting that. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's one of the reasons why the government shouldn't interfere in Ofcom's operation, because um, a, 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 an interference by the Secretary of State in how Ofcom is doing its job can only ever be arbitrary and will therefore undermine the strength of their, their legal processes. Um, so they're in a really good. And if you think taking on these companies is difficult, they've taken on Murdoch. And I think on one occasion, they even judicially reviewed their own secretary of state for trying to tell them to do something. So, no, they're really up for this and, and it will be great. 
but um, the regime won't start ever so quickly because one of the regulation, as Dr. Johnson used to say about dictionaries, is dull work. It's about having dull and grinding and watertight processes. So it will take a little while, sadly, to get this regime up and running to make sure it's strong and effective and will survive more than half the challenges it gets in court, which is where you want to be. Claire, when you look at these um, issues internationally, where, where do you see this sort of regulatory model being in terms of the, the, the vanguard of global, global regulation? Want to be emulated or do you think broadly it will be seen as a missed opportunity? It's a great question. Uh, as Will hinted at the beginning, there are a number of commonalities with, with the EU Commission's approach that's being developed here. Um, I think both are being looked at as possible influences and examples uh, as far afield as you know, Australia and New Zealand, the US, Canada, all sorts of places that are currently in conversation at the very least about how to do this and do this responsibly and proportionally. Um, I think the uh, difficulty of defining harm and the difficulty of trying to really sort out the legal but harmful part of this for adults is going to be the tipping point of whether the UK approach gets lauded and picked up or whether actually it looks like it's too difficult to replicate elsewhere. And of course, it's based on a very specific uh, background of UK law and regulation that, that may not be the perfect fit when you look at other contexts. But it certainly made a dent in the international conversation. It's put the UK out there as a leading voice um, in how to try and do this in a, in a future-proof, sustainable way without infringing on, on rights of speech and expression. So uh, it certainly made an impact on many of those conversations that will be important in building a more international, coherent response to these kind of risks. Helen, what's the one thing that could improve the bill? Oh, one thing. <laughs> one thing. One major thing. Um... I think there needs to be a clearer emphasis on the, the, how, the role that algorithms play and the extent to which algorithms are surfacing content and making decisions for which content viewers see. And there needs to be more of an effort for it to be changed at that systemic level rather than individual piece of content by individual piece of content. Should, should it be here? Should it be flat? Rima, I'm going to finish off with a question to you. After this regulatory approach has been implemented, will the public square be stronger, weaker, or will this little difference be made? It's, it's a really interesting question. And the challenge is that until this has been implemented, we won't know. And um, I, I won't uh, aim to predict the, Im well, impossible to predict. It's, it's quite hard to know how the range of actors will implement. And um, so I think that's just something really important about a review period to just think about what the impact has been and making sure that that's been thought about, measured, and um, back to the point around citizen engagement and deliberation, that, that some consultation and engagement forms a really important part of working out whether that's what we want as a, as a society. So I think there's, opportunities here um, but unsurprisingly also risk and I think there's something about making sure that we don't um, lose track of the importance of generating evidence about whether this works it's fairly novel and I think that that's um, that could result in some really really interesting insights for the future um, and interesting insights for this question of um, what the digital public square could look like. Well the health of our democracy, our health, our safety, our security, our well-being. There are enormously important issues that are fundamental that are wrapped up um, in this discussion, this bill and the regulation that follows it. And as you all highlighted, that the, the conversation will be that will continue with some degree of intensity uh, for the foreseeable uh, future. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today. But the conversation goes on. Thank you so much to our panel for, for, for talking to me and shedding light on what is this very complex set of issues. Uh, I'm certainly a lot more informed and I hope our audience is um, too. Uh, and we'll be watching where the online safety bill goes next with greater awareness and understanding of what is at stake um, for us all as private individuals, consumers and citizens. And it's enormous. 
And please do stay tuned to the RSA channel for more events like these and updates on our research work. You can hit subscribe here on YouTube and visit the RSA website to find out what we're up to and how you can get involved. You'll also find links in the chat to our new report, Platforms and the Public Square by um, Ash Singh and Jake Dusander, which is published today and explores many issues we've, we've, we've discussed today. Loads of great links in there to other ideas and content, including from, from today's panelists. Um, if those of you watching along would like to join the conversation about the event on Twitter, you're more than welcome to do so using the hashtag um, RSA Online Safety um, or in our YouTube chat. All that's left for me is to say thank you once again to Will, Chloe, Rima and Helen. And thank you all for watching. <laughs>